This is Matthew Cratters, Bitcoin University. Today I wanna to answer the question, is there consensus for a soft fork? I would say that based on an informal poll in yesterday's video, that there's actually huge support, at least in our community, for a soft fork that takes care of spam once and for all at the consensus level, namely at the mind block level. You can see hundreds and hundreds of yeses in the comment section of yesterday's video, which I'll put a link to in the description notes below. Yesterday's video where I asked the question whether you would support a soft fork, and many of you voted for not just returning op return to 83 bytes, where it was before Bitcoin Core did all this recent mess, not just returning to, to 83 bytes or maybe 42 bytes or even zero bytes. I believe the default setting for knots right now now is 42 bytes, uh, but you also voted for finally closing the inscriptions hack, which has led to this complete mess on Bitcoin. This is not something that makes Bitcoin better, and many of you understand this. So I'll put a link. This is yesterday's video. You can see that it got out of 12,400 views, it got over 1,200 comments. So this is a very uh, an issue that there seems to be consensus on. You can scroll down, read through the comments. Uh, for example, the, the top comment that got 179 likes, I'm a node runner, this is right paw writing. I'm a node runner and I would support a fork to remove or limit op return, take it a step further and fix the inscriptions hack while we are at it. So if you scroll through these comments, I think you might get an idea of the temperature of the community. When thinking about changes to Bitcoin, we should always ask ourselves whether a change makes Bitcoin better money or worse money. And the changes made in Bitcoin Core 30 have opened the door to more op return spam. Does the spam make Bitcoin better money? I would say no, of course it doesn't. Spam drives up transaction fees when it competes with monetary transactions in our mempools. Spam in blocks makes it more expensive to run a node. You have to deal with the blow to UTXO set from taproot output inscription spam, for example. Op return spam is prunable, but you still have to waste cycles initially downloading it and verifying it. And then it might turn out to be a large op return CSAM, which in which case we have another giant mess on our hands. The other problem with prune nodes and why I don't think it's a real solution to this problem, the problem with prune, prune nodes is that you can't run an Electrum server or electors and you cannot help other nodes bootstrap from scratch doing an initial block block download in IBD. So remember that when Core pretends that pruning op returns is a solution to everything. Like everything, there are trade-offs here. So spam drives up transaction fees when it competes with your monetary transactions in your mempool and other people's mempools. Spam in blocks makes it more expensive to run a node. You have to pay more for storage for a full node since you're being forced to store spam on the blockchain that you don't even want there. Block size is still capped at one megabyte, and so then four megabytes if you count witness data. It's still capped there by consensus, but I have no incentive as a node runner to serve as a cloud storage service for your spam. I don't want it in my storage, and I don't want it on the blockchain because it doesn't help make Bitcoin better money. I'd actually prefer to have half empty blocks, at least at this point in history, than full blocks of spam, especially blocks of spam that contain objectionable illegal content. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I just pause really briefly here to ask you to help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button, that does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. So here's the thing, if you want to accommodate spam, you have to accommodate CSAM spam as well. So then the question becomes, what's the consensus against CSAM spam? I'd say it's close to 100%. 100% of US companies are against CSAM, and I imagine most other countries as well. 99.9999% of people are against CSAM. US federal government is against CSAM. I guess you could make arguments about the elites and Epstein sort of stuff, but still, this is a very clear position how illegal this stuff is. So the question then becomes, what do you think the consensus is about having CSAM? If everyone's against CSAM, what is the consensus on Bitcoin about having CSAM in a place on Bitcoin, namely op return, that was officially designated by both Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin Knots since 2014 to hold whatever people want to put there? I assume the consensus for getting rid of this is very close to 100%. So I'd say there's support for a soft fork to keep op return where it's been for a decade. 83 bytes is fine, as we've talked about. Adam Back was talking yesterday about how developers hate spam. He hates spam. Everyone hates spam. So I imagine a lot of these people, hopefully Adam as well, would be in favor of a soft fork to limit this sort of spam. I just did for fun. I did a search through his 
posts on Twitter on X asking, I hate spam. And we can see that's something that he's been saying many, many times. So I would ask all these people when the rubber hits the road, would you support a soft fork to remove spam and keep Opportune where it is? We talked yesterday in yesterday's video about Pierre Rochard's suggestion for a soft fork to entirely remove Opportune. Chris Guida writing here, not a terrible idea. And then what's even more interesting is Nick Szabo responding. It makes it look like at least that he may be uh, at least somewhat in favor of, of a soft fork for this, saying it's a good negotiating position. In other words, maybe we would walk this back and then instead of completely removing Opportune with, with a soft fork, we keep it at 83 bytes where it's been for a long time. I think there'd be the most support at that position. In this tweet, in this response to Pierre Richard, when he's saying then let's entirely remove Opportune with a soft fork, mechanic writes, I see no opposition to this post, which keeps it minimal rather than limiting it entirely as per the original olive branch also combines other no, known data storage temporarily and then he provides a link to the bitcoin mailing list and this discussion around portland hodl's bit proposal to limit script pub key size in other words the size of outputs to limit every sort of output that's greater or equal to 520 bytes so this would really cap it at the output level and then luke dasher has a response here again this is fairly recent this is from october 3rd of 2025 and the interesting thing here is that portland hodl and luke dasher are not exactly best friends they're on side of on the opposite side of many of these issues uh, but there seems to be consensus at least on the mailing list i don't see any objections here to this modification of Portland HODL's BIP by Luke Dasher. And Luke writes, if we're going to go this route, we should just close all the gaps for the immediate future. And he goes on to talk not just about Opportune, but also talk about uh, Taproot and inscription spam and stuff like this. This gets pretty technical pretty quickly, but I'll put a link to this in the description notes below so you can see what's been happening on the Bitcoin mailing list. And again, anyone can uh, sign up for that. I'm not sure. I believe it's a Google group. That's something I can look into if people are interested. Uh, JMMP9675 asks, how is this a soft fork if the rules are tightened? My response, great question. Soft fork equals rules are tightened by definition. In a soft fork, the new version of the software introduces additional rules that are more restrictive than the old ones. This means that blocks mined according to the old rules are still considered valid. They remain in the blockchain, of course. They're still considered valid under the new rules, but new blocks that attempt to violate the new rules, for example, having large op returns, are rejected. Segwit and Taproot are two famous, fairly recent upgrades from the past decade, and these were both soft forks. So it'd be something similar. Elaine Lowell writes here, something just occurred to me. If we're forced to fork Bitcoin, won't Fink and the ETF managers, namely BlackRock, Core Devs, etc., keep original Bitcoin, while Maxis and Hodlers will be on the new change, on the new Bitcoin. How would that play out? What would it do to price? This is not going to be, this is not going to create a new Bitcoin doing this. This would be more like SegWit and more like Taproot. My response to Elaine, though, is basically that I believe Fink and BlackRock and all the miners would be on our side. I write that uh, Fink and BlackRock and regulated Bitcoin miners, none of them in any way want any opportune CSAM on their chain. Everyone hates CSAM and they hate it at the corporate level, certainly as well. And BlackRock would be against anything that kills the, gold, the golden goose. So the more I look at this, the more I see more and more consensus emerging for this sort of soft fork. Force of Chaos, Chaos One writes here, if soft forks happen, would I have to sell my old Bitcoin and buy it back in the new soft fork version? Very good question as well. No is my response. No, you would just be able to sit on your hands and do nothing. This is the nice thing about soft forks. They're backwards compatible. It's not going to create another asset. You'd be able to just sit on your hands and do nothing. And then I remind him that SegWit and Taproot uh, were soft forks as well. And none of us got any airdrops. Well, SegWit was before my time, before I owned Bitcoin. But with the Taproot soft fork in uh, a couple of years ago, there was no there was no airdrop from this. This is the thing about soft forks in general. For all these reasons and seeing this sort of general consensus, I'd say I'm currently in favor of a soft fork that will fix at least the opportune mess. I'd suggest we keep everything at 83 bytes at the mempool policy default level, which is different than the consensus level, but let's keep that at 83 bytes as the default setting. This is where it's been for a decade. This is where you can set it at knots. You can set it at 83 bytes or 42 bytes, but I'm fine with 83 bytes. Let's leave it where it's been for a decade and where it was just a few months ago before Bitcoin Core 
went rogue and pushed through this contentious change that no one wanted. So let's keep it at 83 bytes at the mempool policy level, which would be, that would be my suggestion. And then as part of the soft fork, let's make it impossible to put large op returns greater than 83 bytes into new Bitcoin blocks. If there's support for this sort of soft fork and this sort of consensus change, I would say let's also close the inscriptions exploit at the same time as part of the same soft fork. Again, I think the most important thing is to get rid of this op return thing as soon as possible. But if we can do inscriptions at the same time and get rid of them, this shouldn't be too hard since everyone hates spam. I'd really like to see us do this fork sooner rather than later because I think that every day we wait is another day where something nasty could end up on chain in op return and then the crisis probably begins. So let's do a soft fork that makes it clear to the world that Bitcoin is a monetary network and that large blobs of non-monetary data are not welcome on Bitcoin at the consensus level as well. I think the only people against a soft fork like this would be the spammers themselves, some crypto VCs, maybe people at companies like Taproot Wizards that make a living from spam. But I think they're clearly in a tiny minority when it comes to spam. And so I think there is general consensus for a soft fork that keeps up return at 83 bytes or less. I'll put a link to some free resources here that will enable you to run a Bitcoin Knots node. And so you can at least enforce these rules at the mempool level. And if you go through here, there's a thread that contains many, many different links. I want to mention my node. I think I've been remiss in mentioning them, but my node finally supports Bitcoin Knots. I'll put a link to my node in the description notes below. There's also Umbral that will let you run a node out of the box. And then my favorite is still remain start nine. This is what I'm using. I have a server one that I bought a couple years ago, and this will allow you to spin up a node in a really easy way on a personal server. You just plug it into the wall, plug it into your home router, and you're all set. And there's all the node software you need there and also lightning node software. You can do coin joins, you can do lots of different apps like the mempool app, for example. I also put a link in the description notes below to Paul Lamb's channel, which is quite good. I'd encourage you to subscribe. But here's a video where he teaches you to build your own Start9 server. So you can run a Bitcoin Knots node. And this one costs only $275. It's a little bit DIY. You'll have to spin it up yourself. But uh, this is another great resource. And be sure, as I said, to look in this thread, which I'll put a link to in the description notes below. Lots of videos, lots of different ways to run a Bitcoin Knots node. You can run one for free as well, just using your existing laptop or desktop. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.